So the agenda for today is our two spam a single uh, simple beam bridge. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the tendons for the beams as well as about the construction stages and uh, if there is some time left, I hope so, a little bit about uh, uh, the design for uh, this bridge. Uh, for tendons, we are going to set a pre-stressing system and the graphical definition of the tendons. And for the construction stages, we are going to assign the needed element groups. We will have a look in the filter and we will set up, of course, the construction sequence. And uh, last in the construction stages, we are looking into the pre-camber analysis. So before we start the project, it is highly recommended to sit down and uh, just make some notes about uh, what I like to consider during my construction stages of my project. So I point out four, I would like to point out four uh, parts here. Um, this should be done for the structure as itself. So what activation or deactivation of what specific elements I would like to consider. Uh, do I use uh, a composite cross section? So is it necessary to assign within the cross section already some uh, stage information? Of course, I need to set up information for my tendons, when the tendons are going to be stressed, grouted, or perhaps removed if they have only a temporarily a purpose in your project. And last but not least, of course, I have to think about some loads during the construction and as well some additional dead loads uh, kind uh, of asphalt or some railing uh, of your bridge. So let's have a look into the construction con uh, con uh, stages of the structure itself. In this example, I would like to use three main stages. Uh, as you see, I not start with the stage number one. I start with 10, jump to 20 and to 30. The reason therefore is quite simple. It's really often happened in uh, ongoing projects that there is a need to insert a certain stage um, and uh, it's always good to have some spare places or spare numbers left to insert uh, these needed stage afterwards during a running project. So my recommendation here is always keep a gap of uh, your stages and not start with one, two, three, four on an ongoing numbering. So what is going to be activated in my first stage or on stage number 10? It's just a substructure. Um, and on top of the substructure activation, I would like to consider as well some creep and shrinkage for 28 days. In stage number 20, I'm just going to activate my first span and a cantilever for my second span. So, and on top of this, I put as well creep and shrinkage for 28 days. And the last major stage of 30 here, my example, is uh, just to activate the uh, um, last part of the span too, and as well put on some creep and shrinkage information uh, for a duration of 28 days. When it comes to tendons, uh, of course, I need to assign some information for the stages for the tendons. This is important to let the software know when I like to activate my tendons or when I like to stress or grout my tendons or if I am intend to remove them as well. And as well, I'm going to need the information from which side I'm going to stress the tendons. In my case here, the tendons uh, for the first span, I'm going to be stressed from the left side. And for the second span, I'm going to stress from the right side. And I assign stages for the second uh, um, span for the stressing at uh, 31 and the stage 32 for my grouting. Uh, regarding loads, uh, of course, we do have uh, additional dead loads and maybe as well some construction loads. In this example, I just uh, added some additional dead load in the stage 40. And this should be uh, happen with a load case definition in Sophie Plus using the load case number two with a load of 9. 0 0.0 kilonewton per meter as a structural line. And to do afterwards uh, a design, I decided as well to use uh, additional uh, load case. In that case, I just selected a settlement uh, for the final stage for the PO1, 2, and 3 of 10 millimeter in the load cases 51, 2, and 53. And traffic loads, we will have a look, a really briefly look after um, uh, we have uh, prepared everything for the construction stages. I use the load model, load model one and the type 300, and we are going to use the influence lines method to uh, calculate these traffic load results. So if I do all my thoughts, I can maybe just prepare a, a table like this 
to have everything on one view. Uh, you see on top, I start with the stage number 10, it's just the, superstru uh, the substructure, then it goes to stage number 20, which contains the activation of the first span, including the cantilever. And then stage uh, 30 is the activation of the superstructure span two. And beginning with, with uh, stage number 40, it's simply additional dead load, some creep to graphic opening and creep after opening. So let's have a look to our live example now. I go here to Sophie Plus. Um, I already prepared this Sophie Plus example, so I head straight forward into my uh, um, uh, Sophie Plus. So uh, just to give you an idea what we have now here in the example, I go through the already defined um, uh, properties here. If I switch on materials, you see we have different materials already here. Uh, we have two different concretes, it's just for the piers and for my superstructure. As well, we do have what is important here, already defined a pre-stressing material. How to define a uh, material I already showed you last time. So simply right click here and you create a new material from design code, for instance. Just have a look now to the pre stressing material. Um, you can access the pre stressing materials by this uh, drop down. Just uh, select the pre stressing steel here, enter your classification, maximum thickness, and the class you'd like to consider. If you intend to change or do some modification on the properties of strengths, please feel free to do so. Uh, just simply uh, um, check the the checkbox here and change the value you like to consider. So, however, for this example, I leave everything on default and um, do not change anything. Uh, regarding the cross section, uh, this cross section, this bridge is a quite simple cross section. Of course, we do have peer cross section. This is a simple a rectangle cross section and we have this cross section as we used as well in introduction here for my bridge. However, I just have a brief look into this to show you again the cross section editor. The only difference to the example in the introduction webinar is I have assigned as well some re reinforcement here top reinforcement, bottom reinforcement, as well as some uh, side reinforcement, and I created as well some shear cuts to get some shear results as well. However, there are no parametrics included in this cross-section for today's, just to keep it simple. What I like to point out that this cross-section is, because I mentioned it previously uh, in, the, in the beginning, we are able to create as well stages here for this cross section. So if you're going to use composite cross section, you can do uh, create new stages straightforward in this uh, tab here for this cross section. However, for today, we are not doing a composite. So I just close this again. Okay. The next uh, thing uh, we uh, have here is um, the axis. Um, I would like uh, to point out only the placements uh, for today here. Double click on this one. And you see I've prepared an access at start as well access at the end and as well my main supports. Uh, this access at start is important or it's uh, um, a kind of a, a help for the software if we are going afterwards to create our uh, tendons, it's recognized, oh, this is exit at start, and the proposal will start with the tendons exactly on this placement one, exit at start, and end at the access at the end. In addition here, I created a construction joint point. It's located here. It's exactly 20% of the second span, where my cantilever of my first span is going to be ended here. So I leave this as it is. Um, the next step, uh, I'd like to show you uh, what happened on the loads. So I've switched off the loads right now. I switched them on again. As already mentioned, I use for this example two different loads. This is uh, my uh, line load, my structure line load of 9 kN per meter. I will activate this line load afterwards in my stage number 40. And I also defined some pl uh, displacements of 10 mm for each peer here, which is going to be considered afterwards in my final uh, design or in the final stage. Uh, the next step would be uh, the pre-stressing. But before heading to the pre-stressing, I would like to jump back to system because there is a task I didn't point out so far. This is pre-stressing system. And if we are going to do a pre-stressing or a post-tensioning uh, in our bridge, so create some tendons, it is important, of course, to select or choose a pre-stressing system. How to do so? Simply use the right click and create a new pre-stressing system. So this is the pre-stressing system task. Um, the important thing, first of all, is if there's no material for pre-string available, you need to create a new one. However, we already did this previously, so we can simply stick on this one. 
um, just a few words here. You are able here to uh, select the company. If the, for instance, VSL, you can select the code and you can select a kind of a group of the product of this company. As well, for instance, here a certain tenant type. So I select this one. You will get straightforward an overview of all the main information of this uh, system you have chosen. As well, you get information about the construction properties. For instance, uh, the outer diameter of the duct, the inner diameter, meter. you will get as well the maximum eccentricity in the duct. I will show this uh, a little bit later on as well. So you get a rough overview here, or you get an idea what kind of information is going to deliver to your pre-stressing afterwards. Okay, I keep this as it is now and I confirm my pre-stressing system with OK. And you see it is popping up straight forward here. So the next step is already defining our pre-stressing. So we have three possibilities or three options to set up our pre-stressing. We can do those for slab elements, shell elements, or beam elements. Today I will concentrate more on the beam elements because we do have a beam bridge here. However, it is possible to combine those in one project. For instance, if you have not only longitudinal pre-stressing for this bridge, uh, maybe you have as well transversal pre-stressing. You can add, of course, if you have prepared the shell elements, uh, pre-stressing by using the shell element, uh, the shell PT. <clears throat> However, let's go ahead with the options here in the beam PT. There are two options uh, possible. Uh, we have uh, here the, uh, the, the possibility to select uh, already defined geometry axis. As we already do have a geometric axis, I will use these options in a few seconds. And we do have a second option that allows me to create a tandem from scratch. So just drawing a line or what I prefer more would be to convert a tandem from an AutoCAD geometry. However, for today, we stick with this uh, option here because we have already developed geometry for our bridge. So I click on this one and I'm going to be asked, please select an axis. So I hover again here over my axis and I get the object snap nearest. So I select this axis and the pre-stressing editor opens up straight forward. So I switch here to the first tab to give you an introduction of the pre-stressing editor. So on top here we have two different modes. The first mode is the geometry mode. This is the definition of your geometry of your uh, um, uh, duct. And the second tab would be the tendon. So you are able to define several tendon based on this uh, geometry. Furthermore, you have the possibility to select and move or um, delete some selected rows here. As well, you have the possibility to change the scale in evaluation, uh, as well if you have some fancy geometries uh, would need it to be checked as well in a plan view, you can do this as well in a plan view here. However, we have not that difficult uh, shape for today, so we can stick with the evaluation view here. Um, however, to start using this pre-stressing editor, it is recommended to start with the geometry mode. Um, this mode uh, allows you to give a specific information to your geometry. And what we already see here is a proposal from our software. Uh, as mentioned before on the geometric axis, as you remember, I assigned here um, an axis at the beginning, at the placement one, and an axis at the end, at the placement uh, five here. So you see the software already recognized, oh, I need to start my tendons from the excess at the beginning and end up here at the excess at the end. Furthermore, it's uh, calculated automatically at 40% at the first span and 60% at the second span here, a low point for your um, pre-stressing, as well a high point here in the mid support. So, of course, this is just a proposal. So. Uh, it's not referred to your selected cross section. So therefore we need to do some changes here. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, change the height of those two points. So as you see here, we have the, the table and uh, column U and V. U is the distance referred to a geometric axis in the horizontal direction. V is the direction in it's the vertical direction referred to your axis. So I'm going to change now this value and this value. There are three options uh, or possibilities to do so. The first is I can simply select those and have a multi-select and can change them over here to a value. The next option is I click through all of them and change them here or 
double click and change the value for each separate. Or I use the control key and the multi select and I can change this here as well. So I use this here, so point 1.15. Um, furthermore, I would like to assign um, a vertical radius uh, for my for my uh, mid support here. Therefore, I go here, select this mid support, and go here to vertical radius. I scroll a little bit to the right side, and I would like to create a vertical radius of eight meter. And this radius should be have an influence length of about one meter. So what is the influence length? This is quite easy. If I just enter here five meter, you will see it straightforward here what happens. So the influence of this radius is five meters. So however, I stick with one meter because what I see now doesn't make sense at all. So I click on eight again to activate this one. That's one important thing I would like to point out here as well, because I'm not sure how you are going to enter your pre-stressing uh, at the moment in your current products. However, we provide you the possibility to use either a span station system or a station system. To change um, um, this, it is necessary to go over here and select the specific type you might like to enter. So if I change to station, you can enter straightforward and exact value of your station. Um, this is completely up to you what you prefer more to use. However, I feel it's like really useful to have this uh, in the percentage because it's always referred to the entire length of your span. So, but however, what means 1.0, 1.40, 2, 2.6, 2 and 3? 1.0 is the first support of the first span. So it's the first span starting at zero. And uh, 1.40 means first span at 40%, it's exactly this point, and so on. Two is the second support, and three might be, of course, the third support. Okay, if you are happy with our geometry so far, uh, we can head straight forward to our tendons as itself. In my example, I would like to create two tendons based on this geometry. One tendon should start here at the beginning and end up at the placement C1, as you see here. A second one should start over here to get an overlap here about the mid support and should end up exactly at the end of my structure. Okay, so what to do here? The first thing is I recommend to select, of course, this first tendon and to assign some information. Uh, therefore, I may ask you to have a look here on the right hand side and I click on this general tab and the first we have the name. So there I just enter a name T21, that means tendon 21. 20 minus, 21 is already a hint to my construction stage I'm going to use afterwards. The next thing is I need to select a load case. As you see here, there's already a load case defined. However, we need to use a load case number 21 because it makes more sense, I think, to name the load cases in the same kind as the construction stages are. That makes it much more easy afterwards to identify them. So just use the load case 21 tendons. And the next thing is, of course, to select a pre-stressing system. We have only one, so the default will be to uh, select the first one. And a number, the number I recommend to use as well, because this makes it much more easier for you afterwards in the post-processing, let's say in the wing graph, to identify the tendon. If you have a huge, uh, if you have um, a huge amount of tendons in your system, just to get an easier uh, um, uh, checking uh, for all your tendon results. So I enter as well 21 for this one. Um, again, here we have the station value. It's a 10 at the moment. However, I would like to use not the station. I would like to switch to the span station system. So I have 1.0. So my tenon will start at station 1.0 and currently will end at station 3.0. But I don't like to do so. I would like to end up it at 1.20. So that means, oh, sorry, 2.20, 1.20 might be too short. So it goes straight over my mid support and end up exactly at this construction joint. Good. The next thing here to do is to assign now the important information for a construction sequence. How to do so? That's quite simple. You see here three possibilities, stage number for stressing, for grouting and for removing. So in my case, I would like to activate this tendon exactly in stage number 21. And it should be going to be crowded at stage number 22. So immediately the, after the stressing. Uh, I can keep this, of course, uh, on zero because I'm not intent to remove the tendons after routing. Um, 
The next chapter is the pre-stressing. Uh, here we do have uh, some um, uh, methods and checking information here. And the most important thing for now is, as you remember, I say that I would like to stress this tendon not from the right, what is the default here, I would like to stress this from the left side. So it will be, the check will be used on this side of my tendon. And I keep this as well as it is tensioning and slip, I would like to consider here in this case. Um, I would like to point out these numbers of tendons because it's uh, really often the case if you just do a preliminary design and you are not intend to cover each tendon separately in your system, it definitely makes sense to just create one geometry and just multiply the amount of your tendons. So I would do so, I will instead uh, using one tendon, I will increase the number to three tendons. So furthermore, there are some pre-stressing additional data and pre-stressing according uh, uh, to stresses. However, I will keep this as it is for default. Good, so this is my first tendon from uh, stages 21 and my grouting for uh, 22. I would like to add now another tendon which should cover exactly this part of my bridge. So therefore I select this one and um, right click and insert tendon. So now you see it jumps again back to the default. It starts from one to three. However, to show it is possible as well to define this here in this table, I will do so. The first thing I do, I switch to my span station again. And this tenor should start at 1.80, so exactly here, and should end at 3, that's fine for me. But the stressing should not happen at 11, because I would like to stress this uh, on my stage 31 and route it at stage 22. And the name of this tendon should be tendon 31. Okay, so you see it's already filled out the necessary information here. However, please have a look here. There's no information selected here. As you remember, we need to do so. Therefore, we start with the load case. This should be the 31 load case. The pre-stressing system should be the uh, system number one. And the number is again 31. And we need as well to do some modifications here. Um, for instance, the pre-stressing direction as the default is already from right, so I can leave this as it is. And I just need to change the value here or the amount of my tendons. Great, so if I'm happy so far with my tendon definition here, I can simply click on OK. I will do so, oh great, perfect. So we see already our tendons here in our bridge. You see, this ends up here and this starts here. Good. Um, just to get a better view on this system, because there's a little bit a lot of information about loads, what I'm not really uh, need, I switch quickly to the filter and activate the filter for the structures. So here we go, it looks much better for me now. Okay, the next thing is uh, I've now defined a tendon and the geometry, but it's exactly in the center of my bridge. What I like to do now is just to move this to the right and clone this tendon as well to the left. Therefore, again, I double click on the tendon and head back to my editor. So the thing I'm going to do now is I change or move the geometry just slightly to the right side. Therefore, I go back to the geometry, I select all of those and change here at the value U 0.9 and click on OK. So you see the tendon is moved to the right. And now the next thing is I would like to create a clone. Therefore, I go to the tendon overview on the left hand side on the sidebar, right click and select the clone option. So click on clone and you see you have simply two parameters to enter here. It's the U offset and this is going to be one minus 1 1.8 and the V set and the V value. But I uh, have no vertical offset here so I just leave it as zero and I click on OK. Now I have already two tenants included in my bridge and the big advantage here by using this clone option is if I will do now a change on my master here. Uh, of course, the clone we copy or copy the behavior of the master as well. Good. Um, you see here, this is the clone tendon and unfortunately uh, the name of the tendons are as well cloned. So I will just rename them briefly. So I just said you are tendon T32 and you will get the number um, uh, 30 to as well here I see it might happen that I did a mistake here oh yes here you see I will just go back I make a typo here this should be 32 great good so I need to double check this here again 32 that's fine okay and 
I would change here as well the number 22. That's fine here. Perfect. Good. I apply this. Now I have my tendons prepared. I have changed the numbering to identify them afterwards much more easier in Bing Graph. Good. That's the definition of the tendons in the beam bridge by using the PT editor. What I'm going to do now is I export this tendon to my database. So I use the export, keep everything on default as it is, and click on OK. So now the tendon geometry and the structures itself is going to be written in the database. And if I head back to my visualization, so we can already see here the tendons. There's a nice feature. It's called uh, uh, Allow Transparency. Therefore, have a look in the third tab here. Allow Transparency. And I can see the geometry exactly what I have defined now. Good. Uh, you might think now, oh, I need more information about the tendons. And currently, it looks like a black box to me. Um, therefore, I would like to point out here the possibility to access the report for your tendons. Please click on the sidebar in Sophie Plus to this symbol. It's called Reports. And the last one here is the results of tendons generation for beam elements, what we did now. So I open this one, and you get the report of your tendons. So what is this uh, report? Port or what is included, for instance, the pre-stressing system information. So you see exactly what is going to be used. And of course, some pre-stressing from left or some more information about the elongation in mills, for instance, here. As well as you remember, you get a summary of all the information. I pointed out the maximum of the eccentricity here. You can check this here as well, as well the nominal extremal force PCO and so on. Furthermore, you get as well some graphic information so I'll switch to the graphics here. This is again my tendon um, uh, geometry here. And you see what I mentioned before. Uh, the geometry we're defining is always the center line of the duct. And the tendon as itself will consider the maximum eccentricity uh, we have defined in our pre-stressing system. That's why the tendon is not in the center of the gravity, uh, in the center of the duct. However, we get as well some information about the forces and the losses here for each tendon we have defined. Good. OK, that's uh, so far all uh, um, for, uh, for the definition of the tendons. Um, I would like to start now to define uh, or to jump in the next topic. It's the construction stages as itself. Of course, we are going to use the defined tendons afterwards in the construction stage management. But for now, we need to do some modifications on our example to consider it in the construction stage uh, uh, properly afterwards. OK, what to do is the following. Currently, we do have our structure here with the tendons and the loads. So at the moment, there's nothing to do on side of the loads. But we need to do some modification on our structural elements. Uh, if we are talking about uh, construction stages in Sophistic, you always need to have in mind you need to assign groups to your elements. And those groups are going to be activated or perhaps deactivated afterwards in the stage management. So how to do assign groups? This is a quite simple process, but I would like to show it on this example again. So therefore, we go to structural elements. And as we do have as well beam elements, we have spring elements, and we have uh, some constraints, we need to go through this three here. We start with the lines. So I select the modify the properties of one or more structural lines command here. Then I click, oops, then I click simply the peers because they need to be assigned to my group number 10 and use enter. And you see here, the number is of course various. I have three selected and the group is at the moment at one. And now I am signing the group to number 10 and I apply and click on OK. Good. The next step is my stage 20. Therefore, I need to change all needed information for those parts here. So I start again with the structure line. So I select those two elements, enter, and change the group to 20. And I apply. And the last one is, just to show it's not always necessary to click on this edit command first, I change the group of my uh, um, uh, second uh, span here, I simply double click on this one and I change this to 30. Great. Okay. However, as I mentioned before, we do have some additional elements here, constraints and springs here in between. So I need to change them as well. How to do so? Quite simple. I use the point link edit command here. I just select all of those, enter, and I see group 
one, I need to change to group 20. Of course, I need to do this for all three defined directions. So I apply it in. Perfect. The next step to do is as well for the point constraint. I modify them, select all of those, enter, and I simply change to group number 20. Good. And I need to do this as well for this support because this is the last peer and needed to be activated in group 30. Therefore, I go again to point link, enter, and change to 30, 30, as well 30. Apply. OK. Good. The same for the constraints. 30. Good. Now, when I've already assigned everything, I always recommend to do a quick check using the filter option. How this works is quite easy. We head straight forward to our filter top here. Have a look here on the top. And you see you have the possibility to show element in group. So currently, all groups are activated. And it seems I have forgotten to uh, change one group. So I will double check this. And I see I forgot this beam element here. OK, I will do this by double click and change this group to 30 because this is one element of my second span. And I click on OK. So if I have a look now, the group number one is faded away. So I'm going to activate simply group number 10. And if I go zoom back here, you see only the pylons are activated. And now we do have on the right hand side the small arrows left and to the right. And if I click to the right one, it jumps to the next group. And I see, oh, that's exactly what I like to have. It's my first span, including the cantilever and my support information. And then I head back to my second span here. And I see it's properly assigned. Good. If we have done this, the next step is export. So click on export, click on OK. There is a second possibility to check the groups on your system, and this is be done in the uh, visualization here. So I switch off the loud transparency here. And you see here at the moment we have just only two colors. This is because the default of the colors is per material. We do have two materials. If I double click on this pylon here, I see the material number 11. If I go to this, I have uh, material number one. However, I would like to change this to pair group. And you see, we have three different colors now. So we see perfectly what we have assigned. There's another nice feature to switch on off groups here. It's this group definition. So I can, so I can as well simply switch up off some certain groups if I like to just visualize them as you see here. So I switch them on again. Good. Um, so as we have now all prepared, from our geometry, from our pre-stress, from our tendons, from our loads, and the stages so far as well assigned, um, um, we are going straight forward to the construction stage management as itself. Therefore, I create here a new chapter. And this chapter or this group should be named um, construction stage. So it's unfortunate on the wrong side. Never mind, I just move it down. Good. The next step is to insert a new task from our task library here. I scroll down to the additional modules and I see this CSM here. This is the construction stage manager. So I select this one, click on OK, and it's going to be inserted. So when I click now, double click on this construction stage management, it's open straightforward, of course, and we already get a proposal or a possibility how the stages might look like for our system. This is the information what the software reads out from the database there itself. However, I will not change anything uh, right now. I will just keep it as it is and I describe you the possibilities of the construction stage manager based on this. Um, the first stage uh, type of stages, as we have here, is um, I would say one of the important ones because here you are going to define all your stages. And this is what I, if I head back to my presentations, this table here needs to be uh, inserted or this information needs to be inserted here in this uh, stages tab. You see, we have the stage numbers started from 20 and up at 35, for instance. We have a title, we have a type of the loads, we have a duration for the creep and, uh, after opening and the creeping construction and um, um, whatever. Um, the types, if I have a look here on the types, uh, we have different uh, possibility to assign the type. Uh, we have, for instance, a self-weight, additional dead load, 
an asphalt. Uh, we have two different creep uh, and, um, and shrinkage. We have creep until opening and after opening. We have the pre-stressing possibility, some construction stage earth pressure, and uh, creep active load and short load without creep. However, here is important to set up your stages in the best possible way. Um, the next step is groups. And we have defined groups for our elements, and those groups are going to be activated, of course, in a certain stage, and this has happened here. At the moment, we have all remaining groups. That means all groups are going to be activated in this stage 20. This was stage self-weight, and they should all be active until infinite. So uh, the concrete age will be seven days after our first activation, and if I go here on this side, uh, okay, the dead load might be from the stage 20, so it's the same. That gives, there's a nice feature here, which show afterwards for the pre-camera analysis. And um, what's nice here as well is the fee spring. The fee spring is the factor for creep of springs and beddings, and the FAC1 is the factor of the stiffness for the first group activation here. So the next step is loads. In loads, uh, here it happened to assign a specific load at a specific stage, of course. So if you see, we have all the available load cases here. We will do it afterwards in the, uh, uh, anyway. You can select additional dead load and say, you should be active at stage whatever. So I will delete this again. The fourth tab is the control parameters. We can leave this as it is for now. However, uh, you see here we have the dead load activation. And this is important to know because if you define your um, uh, loads in Sophie Plus, and let me head back briefly to this Sophie Plus again, to the load case manager, we have all uh, defined load actions here as well as some load cases. And you will see here those load cases which are uh, in, uh, intend to be a, a dead load, a pre stressing, or a creep and shrinkage, has the action none. That means there is no need to care about those load types by yourself during the definition. No, this is going to be done automatically from the construction stage manager. Um, the next, we do have module for creep and shrinkage here. We have tendon real acceleration. We have form work placement. This depends how you like to add additional parts of your structure. Should they be added in system position with original inclination or a tangential cantilever direction, whatever you like to consider here. As well, you have the possibility to activate a casting one load case for comparison. That means I'm not going to accumulate all the results uh, regarding construction stage, I would like to create an additional casting one model to do some comparison for my project. And of course, stress results should they be stored for all stages. Would you like to do a linear analysis, material nonlinearity, and so on? The next step here, we do have the beam selection for check print. Uh, it's always recommend to enter here something. You can do it either by just clicking on plus and enter beam number, for instance, or you just go to this nice butterfly, select an element you are interested in and finish the selection by entering this one. And you see this element is inserted automatically. And of course, last but not least, the text output. At the moment, we do have the full text output for your report. Okay, I will keep this now as it is, and I will just uh, run this without any changes here. I click on OK, and we'll see what happened. So what happened in the background, CSM is going to prepare a text file, and within this text file, all those different modules that I described in the introduction videos are set up and run through to cover all your construction stages uh, here, as well as some um, check prints as we selected for our certain element. Good. Uh, now, when the calculation is uh, ready, we can jump back to our system visualization. And we got a bunch of load cases here, starting 4,000, 5,000, 15,000, 16,000. Oh, uh, no worry about this. Uh, that doesn't mean you have created 4,000 load cases for 15,000. No, it's just a kind of internal numbering system the construction stage manager is going to be used. I will describe this in a PowerPoint slide in a few minutes. Uh, just to go through this default or proposed from the software of the construction stages. If I click here on the first one, I just deselect this one and create an amplitude of 200 to get a constant value. You see, it's going to be active. Activate all your elements in the same stage. If you go to pre-stress, in that case, I have only the first part of my pre-stress, the first span, 21 here. Then, of course, I got some creep and construction, self-weight, 
again, uh, unfortunately, there is nothing uh, to activate here. However, then we have the pre-stressing for the second span. And uh, yes, uh, these are the different load cases uh, we can visualize here. Um, we have the 5,000 load cases as well. They are quite a little bit different. I will show this, uh, I or I would like to show this uh, now on the PowerPoint, what's the different is. Uh, therefore, I jump here back. Okay. Um, there, as you already saw, there's a bunch of load cases uh, during the analysis here. And honestly, there are much more as what we already saw here. So just to give you a rough overview of what happened. Um, the load cases, as you remember, we have the possibility to create the casting one model as well during your um, uh, um, uh, construction stage management are going to be stored in 3,970. Then we do have the 4,000 load cases, what uh, covers the construction stage displacements and forces, the total construction stage displacements. And we have the 5,000, which are difference displacements. I will show the difference in the next slide. Then we do have the 6,000 load cases, which are the inner stresses for the beam elements for creep and shrinkage. 7,000 are the result stresses, the real stresses on the beam elements. Then we do have primary part effects for the pre-stressing stored. And 15,000, 16,000 covers the secondary effects of the pre-stressing. And should be the case, you need to cover more than 1,000 stages in your project. The results are not going to be stored into 4,000, 5, 6, and 7,000. They are switching to 40,000, 50,000, and so on. Uh, the pre camber analysis, um, what I'm going to show you as well, uh, it gives you the possibility uh, um, uh, to analyze or well, Let's save this for afterwards. So just keep in mind, we have this uh, 140,000 load cases available when doing the pre-camber analysis as well. Good. Um, uh, these are the, 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 the coming three uh, slides now, just to give you the diff, the, 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 an explanation about 5,000 and 4,000 load cases. So the 4,000 load cases, as you see on the right-hand side, are the results for the, the displacements and the forces exactly on this stage. It's a kind of accumulation, or it's, it is an accumulation of all previous load cases. That means if I ha have a look here at the load case 4,011, the results includes the stage 11 and stage 10, so accumulation. If we have a look on load case 50,010 and 40,010, those are both of the stage 10 is the first stage in our example. Um, and of course, they are uh, completely uh, uh, similar or they're completely the same. So you see, we have, if you have a look here, the mid span, the bending moment is around about 8,300 here. So we have this as well in four. 4,000 as well in 5,000. If you go to my next stage, stage 11, we do have a, a bending moment of minus 55. And um, the difference to my previous load case, to my stage number 10, is plus 8,298. So and this is exactly the load case results for my 5,000 load cases. So, and the same happens here. So the main message you need to keep in mind is that the 4,000 load cases are accumulated loads on uh, results and uh, the displacements. Uh, as the 5,000 load cases are cover only exactly the deflections and the forces just for this stage. Okay, um, the pre-camber analysis. Um, I just would like to uh, um, jump back to my example. I guess it's um, this one. No, it's uh, this one. Uh, we have this default uh, uh, um, uh, option here. I would like to, because just to save time, uh, to, uh, to go now to an, uh, the same example, but already prepared the construction stages here, the table. So uh, what I did here is just uh, set up everything as you see. I have the activation of my substructure, creep, formwork, uh, activation of a superstructure, and so on and so on. Uh, what I like to concentrate now is the pre-camber option here on the bottom. So the pre-camber analysis is uh, a really nice uh, feature. And what happened in behind this feature, I would like to show here in this uh, presentation. And uh, to activate the pre-camber, you need to check this pre-camber analysis checkbox. And important, you need to select a target stage number. So what does that mean? So have a look here. The pre primary goal or the main goal of the pre-camber analysis, as you see here, is to get a zero deformation at a specific construction stage in reference to the predefined geometry. And the predefined geometry is, in our case now, the bridge as we defined it in Sophie Plus, so a completely flat 
axis. When you uh, request a pre-camera analysis, it is necessary to run an analysis in the background as well without a pre-camber because we need to determine the deflections to use them to achieve the zero deformation and the specific stage. When using a linear premier analysis, this is one important thing, is um, that uh, means that uh, there is no change uh, of the forces in the linear analysis. So only deflections are modified. And uh, when using a pre-camera analysis, it is useful to activate elements without a dead load in a separate stage. This is a big advantage if you're after to get the information to set up your formwork geometry, your uh, shapes uh, for your uh, uh, formwork. So how does it look like here in the in a, in a few pictures. On the left-hand side, you do have an analysis without the pre-camber, right-hand side with the pre-camber. So this is really, really a simplification of what happened is, uh, of course, if you run your analysis without the pre-camber, you have your flat structure as my basis, I run everything and I get a certain uh, deflection on a certain uh, specific stage X, I name it here X. If it comes to the pre-camber, the pre-camber uses exactly the deflection of the construction stage X for the beginning of your uh, um, analysis and this is necessary, of course, to achieve a deflection of zero at the specific uh, construction stage X. Of course, there might be a lot of different steps in between those uh, two uh, graphics. Okay, what does uh, this mean when I'm running now the pre-camera analysis for our example? I put a kind of a collage here for you to visualize it in a better way. On top, we do have our uh, visualization here. On the left-hand side is uh, all the load case uh, top, uh, the load case list, and we do have the construction stage management. Okay, the first stage is the stage number 10. We do have the activation of the substructure. <clears throat> uh, so uh, it's just the substructure activated and you can Already imagining a little bit, you have a deflection outside of the piers here. That means the pre-camber is active and needs to deflect the piers to outside to achieve a completely uh, zero deflection system in this uh, certain stage 40. So let's go to the next stage, creeping construction. Nothing happened here that much. However, I'm now going to introduce the formwork stage. And this is something uh, as special. When doing so, I use um, just the geometry of my element for the stage 19, but the dead load is going to be activated in the next stage 20. This gives you the a big advantage to use these deflections for your formworks uh, on your building side. So if I go now to the next stage 20, I have the activation of the self weight, but no elements included so far, uh, no additional elements included so far. So you see the deflection goes downwards. Now, of course, I need to stress the first span, then I have a creep in construction, and then I activate the formwork for the stage 30. And again, I get, I get as a result uh, this deflection for your formwork. And now I'm activating again the self-weight. And then I have a look at the stresses and creep in construction. And then it comes to my additional dead load case stage 40 and as you see here we have no deflection for this specific uh, stage if i go downwards we do have um, additional creep to traffic opening and um, i entered as well the creep after opening and there's something special here for this stage 55 if you head here to the right uh, most uh, most right side here we have a creep steps number three that means i'm not going to include one creep step for all these uh, 30,000 days. Now I am going to divide them in three uh, parts. That means the software takes care automatically for the two missing stages. So there's no need to use or to assign 56 and 57 when uh, needing uh, more creep steps here. This is done by the software automatically. The only thing you need to care about here is to keep enough uh, spare places or numbers in the stages to cover exactly the creep steps, not to get in an error message or an overwriting of a following uh, load uh, stages. Okay, if I go here downwards, you see the deflection of the uh, pre-camber on top. So uh, let's head back to the example here again. So this is uh, again our example. And what I like to show you now is how it works to assign or to define this formwork deflection in, 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 in the 
construct a stage manager. Therefore, it is necessary to create two stages, one for the framework and one for the activation of the uh, su um, uh, superstructure span one plus cantilever in that case. Then I need to go to the groups. And I know my group 20 contains all my superstructures for the span one plus the cantilever. And I would like to activate it in stage number 19. But this dead load should activate it at stage number 20. And this is all you need to do to get this results of the deflection for your formwork in stage number 19. OK, so I can uh, cancel this because the results are already available. Good. Uh, this was so far the construction uh, uh, stage uh, manager. Um, I would like to go now to a little bit uh, into the design and the traffic loads because we do have 10 minutes left. I guess that should be uh, possible. Um, therefore, I just go to uh, another stage of this example where I've already inserted uh, traffic loads and design. But just to give you an idea how to create this uh, traffic loader. So I, you can find it, I just show the tasks. So I scroll down, traffic loader here and just double click on this one. So this is the traffic loader of Sophistic and behind, or if you use this traffic loader, you need to know you're going to use uh, influence lines for the calculation of your uh, forces or your results. So how it works. Uh, the first step is the lanes tab. There we have the possibility to select what axis we are going to use or refer our uh, loads to. Then you can select a certain type of your cross section. That means what profile or alignment or uh, whatever uh, you, you like to use here. I'll stick with the Euro code here for this example. Then you need to define the curb stone and the deck left, right, of course. Um, you will uh, get, of course, some information here about the alignment you have selected based on this information. The next step is the load train. Now it's important to uh, add load trains to your um, project. How does it work? Quite simple. Use the add load train and you can select one of those available. If you might need a load model, um, a load train from a different code, just uncheck this box and you can select off all of the available uh, library. However, for instance, if I'm going to use an LM1 and I would like to consider type 100, I just add this to the project. You get a summary here of the values of this load train. I can extend this to show all parameters here. The next step is calculation, and this is uh, important to know if you start uh, a new project and it's maybe a huge project. I personally recommend always not switching everything on at the beginning just to get a feeling how it behaves. I would just keep it simple and just run through uh, the beam and Y results just to save calculation time and uh, to um, yeah, make it a little bit simpler at the beginning. If it runs through properly, you can, of course, act, or you need, of course, activate to all of them. Furthermore, um, there are settings on the bottom here, transversal load distribution, and there we can uh, decide between a single girder system and multi girder systems, as well between different uh, interpolation points of shell systems. Good. Uh, load groups. Load groups are important uh, because um, we need to combine or set up a, a certain setting for your um, load situation here. Uh, we define uh, or we uh, distinguish between load group one or between load groups. I have two here and cases. So if you have a look at load group one, this is uh, gets the title I decided TS, which means it's only tandem loads. And we need to define a, <clears throat> a base load case for this. This load, load, load case or this base load case is important uh, because in this load case numbers, uh, the envelope of your traffic loads are going to be stored. As well as it's important to define an action group here in what group you're going or you intend to store the results to use it afterwards for your design or, probably, or maybe not. Uh, just one more uh, um, information here on this base load case number. You see it's not possible to change the ones and the tenth here. The reason therefore is quite simple. If we head back to calculation, you see uh, here two columns, load case minimum and load case maximum. For instance, if we have a look at beam MY, we have nine for minimum and 10 for maximum. And those numbers are going to be used here instead of the two O's. Um, of course, uh, we need, or it uh, might make sense to create some cases here. The first case in our uh, bridge here is uh, to set up a center alignment of our loads. And how this works is quite easy. I just select 
a new case, go on alignment, it's center, and I select what loads should be uh, considered for this alignment. And I'm going because I intend to create a group with a tunnel system. Just select the, just select the first line here, GRO -O, uh, tandem system. Furthermore, I need to assign a load, a traffic load model for this one. And I do this as well for the um, uh, right case, uh, for the most right here and for the most left here. And the same is going to be used for my load group number two. The only uh, difference here is I'm not going to use the tandem loads. I'm going to use the UDL loads. So I just enter here UDL and select as a result load case G underscore U and I have already load case number 200 as a default because of load group number two. Then I define four cases in that case. First case is the load model on, on the center. Then we have on the most right, you see here we have uh, nine kilonewton and two and a half kilonewton, the most left and as, as well the carriage way width. If everything was set up properly and you're happy with, just click on OK. I already did the analysis, so I don't do this right now. What you get out is um, you have a look in the report here uh, you get some pictures. Uh, of course, you get a, a lot of uh, results here. You get information about your selected load models. You see uh, where is your location of your loads here. And of course, you get a lot of uh, pictures here of your influence lines. So in my case, I just select this element to print out this information. But you see really nice uh, what load situation is going the worst case. It's going to be the worst case for exactly this element here. <clears throat> Okay, so if we have our loads or our traffic loads defined and we have results, I'll just, I will just have a briefly look into WinGraph to show you the results as well here. So go to results, beam element forces, just have a look at the bending moment, make it a little bit bigger. This is the load case number one. And you see here we have the load case 105 and so on. You remember nine and 10 was the minimum and the maximum of the bending moment. So we have 109 and 110 and the same for our UDL load here. Okay, good. So we close this again. The next step is to the way to our design is to insert a new group just to keep a, a nice order here and to insert uh, the task CSM bridge design super positioning to create your combinations for a design and the CSM bridge design beams. Those can both find uh, here insert task and the computer edit bridge design. If you miss this CSM bridge design super positioning, this can be inserted only once in your project. That's why it's not shown up here. <clears throat> So I double click on CSM Bridge Design Superpositioning and have a look uh, what is possible here. This is a quite easy uh, uh, thing to do. Um, you only decide for what you are going to use your action. Should it be considered in the ULS and SLS or just ULS or just SLS? And as well, what uh, additional loads should be considered uh, for this um, uh, design. So uh, I keep this as it is, so it should be ULS and SLS. If you run this through, I already did this, I have a check to the report. You get some information, oops, sorry. I get some information here uh, from where the load is going to be taken. You see here from CSM, CS table, and so on and so on. What I like to point out is what happened here. You get an information about the code is going to be used and what combination rules are considered for your design. You get the, the, the formula here in a graphical way as well, the action group, the parts, so these are the load cases, and so on and so on. Good. Um, the next step might be uh, to define, of course, um, the uh, design of the beam elements itself. So I insert this task already and I double click on this one and we get again a table uh, with different options. The first option is always to check print, which is always recommended to do. Uh, what is needed to do for this check print, just activate this checkbox here, go to beam selection for check print and select a certain specific element here. Here we go. And this is going to be considered here for this check print. Then, of course, you can simply select ultimate limit state if you are interested to do a crack control or stress limitation. Or, of course, if you do use tendons, you need to do a compression check. Um, or if you like to do a simple stress range here, please feel free to activate this one. I already did this calculation to save time. I just click on cancel. However, I would like to show you the results of this design for the refor uh, reinforcement, for instance. So I had or I start again the wing graph and go to design, beams, design, and I go to longitudinal reinforcement layout. 
one. So just to get a better view here, I just increase the figures here. And you see, this is the reinforcement of the layer number one. And when you have now in mind, oh, what means layer number one? The layer number one is the definition of your reinforcement layer. So there's the easiest way to check this is either go back to Sophie Plus, where you have defined your cross sections. I will do so just to show you. And if you double click on this one, you get the information. This is layer number two. And this is layer number one, is the bottom one. Okay, and we have of course layer number three and four on the sides and so on. There's another option to do to, to check this. You can open as well the result viewer. I will do so here. It's this one, result viewer, and you can visualize your cross section and check some settings you did. So I go to results, system, cross section. <clears throat> and single reinforcement, for instance, reinforcement layer, and you see M is the top layer here, or just the layer number is two, this is one. So back to wing graph here, that means layer number one is the bottom layer in my uh, cross section, layer number two is the top layer. In that case, the minimum reinforcement is not going to be increased. Maybe I can uh, decrease the minimum reinforcement here. As well, we can have a look at the stirrups or the link reinforcement for layer number one and so on. Okay, good. Uh, that uh, was uh, the presentation for uh, today. Uh, thank you very much for attending the Sophistic webinar today. Have a good day and hopefully see you on one of the next one.